first, uh, I really hope my voice <laughs> goes all the way to the end. Um, so I hope you can bear with me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my voice. Anyway, um, yeah, so I want to start this talk by sharing a little bit of a, a personal story um, on like basically how I end up in the free software community. Um, <clears throat> and it was some years ago when I started to care about my privacy and my data, and that's kind of like how I started to uh, get in contact uh, with some free software solutions. And then with that, I also um, started to notice how, like the huge impact that uh, technology has in our lives um, and how it is shaped by so many actors. So one of them, you, the ones that have the knowledge and the skills to actually create the technology, but also by decision makers who have the responsibility to regulate such technology. And since then, then I became interested in uh, creating that bridge between these two actors and helping them to understand what one another um, and kind of like serve as a bridge. Um, and that is the reason why I'm here today to, to talk about policy topics, the same way I also talk with decision makers to, uh, about free software. So yeah, first uh, let's start to talk about who we are. Um, yeah, so we are the Free Software Foundation Europe. We are a charity that empowers users to control technology, and uh, we do so with free software. Uh, and I am Lina Ceballos. Uh, I'm a policy project manager at the Free Software Foundation Europe. Um, and yeah, we <coughs> work in a lot of uh, policy-related uh, activities, and that's what I'm going to talk today. But first, I always like to. Um, start with the basics, probably some of you know this by heart, but some not, don't. Uh, so when we talk about free software, we're talking about four freedoms. So the freedom to use, to study, to share, and to improve the software. And whenever one of these freedoms is absent, then we're not talking about free software anymore. Um, and I think it is important to always remember this because yeah, nowadays there are some, uh, they want to restrict some freedoms uh, some of these freedoms, and uh, I think it's always important to remember that this, these four freedoms are what free software is. Um, yeah, so to get a little bit into the topic of our policy activities, we have a, a very nice campaign or initiative uh, called Public Money, Public Code. Uh, and we, uh, basically with this campaign, we are demanding that all the software that is developed for the public sector should be available for the, for the public, um, and this means to be under a free software license. Because if it's the code paid by the public, that should be also available to the public. Um, yeah, so uh, with this uh, campaign, we also use it as a framework. So whenever we're addressing decision makers, we always bring uh, the arguments behind this initiative because they're really uh, precise and they're very clear. Uh, and yeah, we, we basically uh, use them to uh, make them understand first the importance of free software, but also the importance of uh, spending uh, public funds in the most efficient way and how that uh, relates to free software. Um, yeah, so for this uh, uh, campaign, we have also an open letter that you can also sign as individuals or organizations but also by administrations. Uh, so far we have seven administrations, some from uh, Germany, from Spain, we have the Parliament of Asturias and the city of Barcelona. Um, yeah, so this is what we do. We also ad, uh, approach decision, uh, public administrations and then we demand this uh, and we try to explain them uh, the whole uh, idea behind public money, public code. And these are some of the organizations that have support or a uh, call. Uh, that doesn't mean that the ones that are not here are not like working on this either. But uh, yeah, so far these are the, the ones that have joined or uh, yeah, open letter. Okay, yeah, so now to actually get into the policy topic, uh, today I'm gonna be talking about uh, mainly two EU institutions. Uh, one is the European Commission and the European Parliament. 
Uh, there is also the council, but because of time and the, the matter of the, the talk, I'm not gonna get into it, so I'm just gonna talk about these two. So let's start with the, <coughs> the European Commission. So the European Commission is uh, the institution that, has, that can propose legislation. So whenever there is a new legislation, so is the European Commission coming up, coming up with the uh, first proposal. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about the, the framework that they have worked uh, to share the uh, public in infrastructure to, 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 a, to an extent. Um, and I think to um, talk about this, it is important to talk about the EU FOSA and the EU FOSA projects. We were um, some pilot projects that were given by the European Commission, uh, by the European Parliament to the European Commission. And they were basically kind of like a, some programs to audit and find vulnerabilities in the free software that the European Commission was using, or like the EU institutions actually. So first it was EU FOSA uh, that it started in 2014 or so, and then after that uh, EU FOSA 2 came, which uh, was already like groundbreaking because then this program was already extended uh, with EU FOSA 2. And what they did there was they just uh, organized bug bounties um, and hackathons and just basically tried to uh, audit all the, as much as they could, uh, the digital infrastructure of the EU institutions. Uh, however, there was not a uh, budget allocated to this. Uh, and yeah, in 2020, this, the EU FOSA project, the EU FOSA 2 stopped. But then uh, in 2020, the uh, open source strategy came. Uh, first, like this one, this open source strategy was, is not a law, so it's, uh, as it says there, it's a communication from the commission to the commission. So basically it's not like a binding document or anything like that. But anyway, so in this text, um, first we welcome that the European Commission already acknowledge the benefits of free software. Uh, but the text itself is rather weak and a little bit ambiguous uh, to be a strategy of its own. So here, uh, some features were introduced, such as the open source program office, um, which actually acts as a facilitator for activities online in the strategy itself. Um, and activities such as FOSA 2 were mentioned, but it was also not mentioned why uh, they didn't continue. Um, yeah, so the, the text is uh, a little bit uh, ambiguous and then I'm gonna give some examples. So for instance, there is a part that says that whatever it makes sense, the commission will share the source code of its future IT projects. Uh, so this is something that uh, we somehow criticize because instead of going on the direction of free software first, uh, they came up with this wording that whenever it makes sense, uh, so we don't know when that when it makes sense and to whom it makes sense. So this is what we mean by being ambiguous and yeah, not being clear to be a strategy. There is um, another example, for instance, that uh, here I just copy the the, the text. So uh, there will be somehow the commission have to choose to uh, the freedom to choose non-open technologies where there are good reasons to do so. Uh, so again, when are there, what are good reasons and to whom these reasons are good and so on. So yeah, this is the kind of like uh, loopholes we found in such strategy. And yeah, however, then one year later, then the commission uh, came up with the decision. So this, this was a step uh, because then it moved from to be a project or yeah to to something more legally binding. So this is this is a, a legally binding document, and with this decision, then they just uh, want to define the conditions uh, for for the commission to share the the open source uh, with them to facilitate the reuse and the sharing of uh, such software. So basically, they kind of uh, took some of the uh, activities that uh, were included uh, with the strategy, and then they just put it in a legal binding document. And uh, apart from that, 
and this decision also included the public repository, which is uh, something that we also uh, demand or try to demand uh, within our public money, public code campaign, which is that, I mean, if you're gonna share this, the software and the code, then this, this code uh, should be in a public repository. So now we have a public repository from the commission to share their open source whenever it makes sense and when there are good reasons to do so. Uh, but I mean, this is, this is a step. Now, I mean, we acknowledge that the commission is, is, is trying. Um, not, uh, not, uh, it's not perfect, but uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a step. So this is basically the framework that there is within the European Commission. So now let's talk a little bit about the parliament. So when once the commission uh, presents a proposal, then the European Parliament and the council work on a text, and then the three institutions uh, find a common text, basically. So um, I'm gonna mention some of the digital topics that uh, have been keeping us busy over the last months. Uh, but I also want to um, show, I mean, this is kind of like an overview of what we are actually working on. Uh, the green um, sorry, files are uh, related to liability and free software. So yesterday my colleague Alex talked about this um, like in depth, so I'm not gonna touch that that much, only on the AI resolution. Uh, and then I'm just gonna basically talk about these three. So the AI resolution, uh, the declaration of digital rights and principle, and I would mainly focus on the Interoperable Europe Act, which is something that is going on at the moment and that we are, um, yeah, being active uh, on this. Okay, so let's start with the AI resolution. So basically, the, this was um, um, when the AI, uh, when the EU institutions wanted to regulate the AI technologies, then they, uh, or the parliament, created this specific committee called AIDA committee, which was uh, created mainly to work on this resolution. So first of all, this is a resolution, not a regulation, which is which means that it's not a legally binding document. But this resolution is, uh, it was supposed to serve as a guideline for the ongoing AI Act, which is the um, regulation. Um, and then we step in because since it was going to be a guideline, so we thought, let's start from there and then let's try to transfer this into the AI Act. Uh, and then with the, within this, and we um, manage uh, from the European Parliament to bring something on public money, public code uh, related to AI. So there is uh, something that, uh, again, were appropriate. Uh, some open source software can be procured when it comes to AI uh, solutions. Um, and I, I mean, I like to bring up this uh, example because this shows first that, uh, I mean, this specific part, this uh, specific wording was voted uh, and then he found a huge majority. So this shows that the European Parliament is, you know, willing or like acknowledge the benefits that uh, free software can have even for AI solutions. Uh, so this was something good and positive that we uh, found after the whole process. However, as I mentioned, then this is a, this is not a legal, a legally binding document. So, I mean, yeah, this it's not law, but uh, it, it should uh, be a guideline to for the AI Act, which is happening at the moment and will be voted next week. And yeah, I'm not gonna get into it. Um, yeah, so the second one is the uh, Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles. Um, and with this, we decide to step in because this declaration uh, will serve as a reference point for the digital transformation of Europe. So basically we just, yeah, we saw the opportunity and then we decided to also pick this fight. Um, so with this specific declaration, uh, the outcome was not uh, ideal, at least not after 
the interinstitutional negotiations, at least from the European Parliament, uh, they actually understood the importance of free software on AI because there is a part on this declaration that uh, refers to AI technologies. Um, so the European Parliament understood this importance. However, uh, the, this wording that we managed to include in the uh, European Parliament uh, text, so to say, then uh, it fell short of its ambitions after the interinstitutional negotiations. So after cons Council and Commission, the three of them uh, work in the final text. And then the final text was uh, somehow it makes references to promoting interoperability, open technologies and standards, which uh, from to, like for our perspective is uh, also a little bit ambiguous. The wording is not super clear and the wording that it was uh, from the European Parliament text was, was way better. So yeah, this was not the, a good outcome but again, um, I wanted to talk about this specific example because this again shows that the European Parliament already understands the importance of free software. And now let's talk about the interoperable Eurobat. So last year, the European Commission proposed this act. And basically what they want to do is uh, to have a cross-border regulation that it will help the EU, but also member states, specifically public administrations, uh, to deliver interoperable digital services. So basically, they just want to regulate how administrations can communicate with one another. Um, but yeah, I mean, let's uh, bring an example here. So basically, what we're talking about uh, in this specific case is, uh, let's say you are driving from Spain to France and then you're taking your car with you and then you go to France and then you wanna find a parking spot uh, and then this machine that gives you the ticket to be able to park doesn't recognize the plate from Spain, only recognize plates from France. And then you are unable to park in this specific place. So this is, this is what we're talking about. So just digital public services that public administrations um, have to uh, deliver to citizens. And that's why interoperability is important because then you can basically do this and these two systems can speak with one another. So, I mean, this is uh, it's, it's super interesting that they want to regulate this. Um, and again, the role that free software can play uh, in interoperability is it's really uh, important and that's why we also decide to uh, step in with this act which is ongoing at the moment so the proposal already acknowledged the crucial role that uh, free software and open standards have however we have found uh, some loopholes and i basically want to talk about this uh, right now but first, <coughs> I want to um, yeah, explain what's new or what this act wants to implement. So basically, they want to, first they want to create some kind of governance is, uh, structure. So they're gonna create two bodies. They're gonna create uh, the Interoperable Europe Board and the, the Interoperable uh, Community, uh, Europe, yeah, the European uh, Interoperable Community. And basically these two uh, bodies will, uh, it's kind of like a, a bottom up and top down uh, workflow. So basically the, the board will be the one setting up the agenda and the priorities and actually making the decisions because they're gonna be able to set up this agenda for a whole year. And they're gonna check on the community and rely on their ex expertise and yeah, basically they're just gonna get input from the community. Um, so regarding this specific point, uh, this is one of the first loopholes that we found. Uh, and then it's, uh, so far in the, um, in the board, um, there is not inclusion of uh, any of the stakeholders apart from, so the, the board will be, uh, so far how the text is, will be um, composed by 
one representative of each member state, the European Commission, the Committee of the Regions, and the uh, European Economic and Social Committee. So this is how the board will look like, how the text is at the moment. So we can see that there is not really like any civil society involvement there. Uh, and it is true that uh, we're gonna be part of the community, but we have to keep in mind that the board is the, the, the body that has the decision-making power, and they are the ones setting up the agenda, and therefore that's why we find crucial that uh, civil society or the open source community is present in such board. Um, yeah, so this is one of the first loopholes we found. A, another point that I want to make here is that, I mean, of course, there are so many other things that they want to implement, such as like, uh, training and peer reviews and sandboxes. But uh, because of the topic, I'm just going to focus on the features that I, we believe that can uh, affect the free software community or somehow you can get involved and, and so on. So this is not going to be like a completely thorough analysis of the text. Um, yeah, so the second thing that I wanted to mention is that basically with this text, they want to make mandatory sharing and reusing um, the digital, the, the software, basically. But then the way the text uh, is written at the moment, it says that when requested. So we believe that this is where free software can play a role and this principle of going on the direction of free software first it's important because if you want to make mandatory being able to share and to reuse, then first of all, you should not request it because then if you go in the direction of free software first, then you can actually do it without requested or being requested to do so. And then, then you should be able, if you don't do it, then you should explain why you're not doing it, basically. So this is something on the wording that it's that we find a little bit problematic and that we're also trying to um, advocate for. Uh, they also want to implement some kind of assessments for uh, public administration. So basically uh, the new uh, infrastructure that they want to create, if they want to procure something new, then they have to follow certain requirements, so to say. And then they will give a label because now it's, everything has a label. So they want to also implement a label for interoperable solutions um, label. So if you, if you run this assessment uh, and then everything is good, then this uh, technology then had, uh, has this label of uh, interoperable solution. Um, and another thing uh, that they also want to introduce, or not introduce, but kind of like uh, regulated as part of, the, of this whole framework, it's a portal. So basically this will serve as a, a single entry point for all public administrations to share their solutions. Uh, the board will also share the agenda there. Um, and yeah, basically through this portal, then administrations will be able to communicate and speak with one another. This is something that can already exist, which is called join up. Uh, so they want to just build on this and make it, uh, yeah, call it the, Europe, the European uh, Interoperable Portal. Uh, yeah, so basically uh, the things that we found problematic was uh, first that uh, there is no inclusion of civil society uh, nor the free software community in the board. Uh, and we believe this is really important because uh, we are the ones, or you guys are the, uh, the ones that have the expertise and that could actually um, guide the board in making such uh, decisions, such as setting up the agenda, even more when you're talking about interoperable digital services. But then there are other things, such as uh, there is not really like indicators or something to measure all this, uh, all the, the progress of such activities. So it is really, it would be really difficult to actually monitor uh, the progress if there is such uh, of these activities because there is not really indicators that we can use to, to do so. So this is something that we, we found uh, a little bit problematic and then we also are trying or aiming to 
improve. Uh, again, there is uh, not a dedicated budget for this, so I think I already mentioned this before, but this is uh, an issue, and we believe that, uh, I mean, we know that this is not a funding program, and the, 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 the spe the, it doesn't have to be too specific, uh, this budget in this text, right? But it has to have at least a reference where the, coming, the, the money is coming from, and this, this is not the case at the moment. Um, there is also lack of uh, the reference of the definitions of what free software is and open, standard, um, open standards are. And we believe that this is important because, um, I mean, because we need to understand what we're talking about. So if we're going to talk about open source, then we need to know that we all mean exactly the same thing. Uh, so these definitions need to be included as well. Uh, in the text. There is something with uh, a procurement. So, I mean, we know that uh, procurement is a national affair, so the EU cannot do much. This is a member state thing. But what the EU can do is to set up some kind of guidelines for member states to provide a kind of like cross-border procurement, so to help member states in establishing a common and harmonized way to procure uh, open source, especially. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is the, the right place to do so, because if we're going to talk about interoperability, we're going to talk about administrations from different countries speaking with one another, then we also need to, uh, we need to set up some kind of guidelines of the way public procurement is taking place. Mm. And last but not least, um, we believe, as I already mentioned, that if you're going to uh, have free software interoperable solutions, then these solutions must be included in a code repository. So basically what we saw before, this can be reused uh, instead of creating something new, but administrations should be able to share their code there. Uh, and in this way, it would be also easier for other administrations to reuse such uh, software. Um, and yeah, that's the reason why we believe that uh, this um, place is the right place to have a free software uh, first approach. So if we're going to talk about interoperable digital solutions, then let's go for the direction of free software, because I think we all here agree that it will... Uh, I mean, the, the, the role that free software plays for such a uh, goal, it's super important. Uh, and this is the place where such approach should uh, brought up. Um, so as I mentioned, this is uh, something that is going on at the moment. Now we are meeting decision makers because the, the parliament is working on this text. Um, and we're trying to influence how this text uh, will look like uh, and we're also trying to bring up these demands that I just mentioned here and also to translate them, tra translate this to them and showing them the importance of free software. And um, yeah, uh, we believe that this is, this is the moment where we need to step in and actually help uh, them to understand and yeah, to guide them to bring this free software first approach. We don't know how this is going to look like. Uh, as I already mentioned with the declaration, this can change. Uh, this cannot change. This, this uh, cannot be changed or something like that. You know, the text can look uh, so different in the end. But uh, at the moment, we're uh, actively um, advocating for free software uh, in the specific case. Um, yeah, so just to kind of start wrapping up, um, I want to share a little bit with you how you can also get active. Uh, we are a very small organization and we uh, have very limited resources so you can also help us. Uh, and how, do you, how can you do that? So first, you can always convince your public administrations. You can always use the demands from our public money, public code. We have a lot of material. We have a brochure that we have translated in, in various languages. So you can always address them and talk about this with them. You don't need to go there angry and tell them that they have to change everything, they have to migrate everything. But if you go in a friendly way and try to explain them why free software is important and how free software can help them, 
this is a, this is a huge step. And here I also like to uh, remi uh, remind you that when we talk about public administrations, we are talking about the yeah, parliaments and uh, the city hall and so on, but we're also talking about uh, schools, universities, so you can always talk with the, you know, the your university or your school. Uh, you can also go to like your local or your region and, uh, and then talk with public administrations there. Uh, of course, if, if we address this in a in a higher level, such as city halls or parliament, it was great. But you don't need to do that. You you can always go for low hanging fruits such as schools, universities, etc. And of course, you can also sign the open letter uh, as an individual, but uh, also as an organization. So if you have an organization, uh, you're more than welcome to sign the, the open letter. Um, and again, if you can convince your local uh, public administration to sign the open letter, that's also uh, something great. But we also like to uh, tell that uh, you know the, the end or the final goal it's not that they just sign there, the logo appear on the, on the website, and then after that they don't do anything else, but uh, it's, it's way better that they actually talk about this, they know and they become aware of this for the upcoming decisions they make. Um, yeah, and this is connected to spread the word, so you can help us spread in the word. We also have a from material that we can ship uh, for free, so you can go to our website and get stickers, leaflets, uh, brochures, everything, and then you can also actively uh, share the word because we, we need you <laughs> for this. And of course, uh, you can always donate to us because we are a charity and we are based on donations. So uh, if you like what you, we're doing, uh, we are very happy to get your donations. Uh, I prefer this very nice QR code. <laughs> if someone wants to scan it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna wait. <laughs> um, yeah, but I also have it here as well. Uh, so you have some time here uh, while I get some questions uh, to scan and yeah. But uh, again, you can help us with spreading the war or just really sharing what we do, uh, go to, we share a lot on our website what we're doing um, through news items, press releases. So, yeah, uh, everything that you can share is more than welcome. And yeah, I hope you uh, somehow enjoyed the talk that you didn't fall asleep because, of course, after lunch it's also a little bit uh, uh, yeah, challenging. And I'm very glad my voice managed <laughs> to finish the talk. Yeah, so thank you very much. And yeah. Well, do we have some time for questions? Yes. Or if anyone wants to say something? I was really clear. Okay. Okay. All the, very interesting, thank you. But all the different acts, the digital rights, the interoperability, and you say it's, it's in discussion and you're, you know, lobbying, etc. and you don't have a timeline, but do they give... There's no timeline and no budget. Is that, is that what I understand? There's no, there's no, there's no budget alloc allocated to this very, very important detailed yeah. work. Yeah, I mean, regarding the timeline, uh, I would say, uh, I would dare to say that at least the Interoperable Europe Act wants to be done uh, soon because they, 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 they also changed the presidency. Um, and next year there will be elections uh, in the European Parliament, so I feel like they they want to get this done uh, soon. And it's also not uh, such a problematic file as the AI Act or the Cyber Resilience Act. So I think this this will be done soon. So there is not like a strict uh, deadline, but there are already some kind of deadlines, at least from the European Parliament. The the leading committee wants to vote on the report on, in July, if possible, and then this will go to plenary uh, after the summer break. So it's, it's still some time. And regarding the budget, yeah, there is no, um, there is no mention of where the, um, the budget for such activities will come from. Uh, and this is something that we're at least trying to uh, 
bring into the discussion and make them aware that uh, these activities also need a budget. Um, and I think other stakeholders and other actors are also realizing the, the importance of such, such budget. Uh, but as I mentioned, I, I don't, we don't really expect that they will go through this, uh, they will include a whole budget on this text because this is not the right place. But uh, 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 at least uh, a mention of where the money should come from, it should be in the text or something. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? We have still a few minutes. Um, thank you very much for, <laughs> for the talk. Uh, I have interest in a related topic uh, about uh, the recent debate about privacy and uh, encryption and some regulation in, in this area. Uh, and the conversations that we are hearing about is now the, the topic are currently uh, saying that uh, encryption is, mm, is going to be weakened, privacy is at risk, and I, am cu I have curiosity about uh, if the Free Software Foundation has uh, discovered something that can affect uh, open source development developers in in this area, in 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 this now um, incoming um, regulation that we'll be seeing in the next future. Um, maybe I have a question back. Are you talking about this uh, uh, chat control, the, like this uh, new yes, pr proposal where they want to kind of it, scan? It, it's just chat control. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're actively not working on this. Uh, we, uh, uh, we've been discussing uh, and we know the risks that this legislation has. Uh, but as I mentioned, we are a really small organization and we have to pick our fights. Uh, so that's why we, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things happening at the moment on digital things and digital matters. Um, and we have seen it over the last months uh, with new and new proposals. Uh, but at least from our side, it's uh, really difficult to, like from the staffers uh, to uh, step in. But we rely a lot on our community. We have a big community, a big team as well, not only staffers. And this is something that we've been, uh, we are aware of. And we are also encouraging others to step in and to help them and to guide them. Uh, and that's why we also said, like, if you, if you have any ideas on how to do this or you, have to, you want to exchange some thoughts on this, you're more than welcome to send us an email and we will, you know, somehow guide you or, you know, encourage you to, to do so. But from our side, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult in terms of human capacity, I would say. Yeah. Understandable. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.